So we were uh, talking about uh, torsional work with uh, stress and strain. Remember we came up with the equation that the uh, shear stress due to torsion was equal to the torque times R, and that's a multiplication, it's not a subscript. We did have some subscripts in there, but that's torque times R divided by the polar moment of inertia. And uh, sometimes the polar moment of inertia, we use the symbol J, but I'll use uh, the uh, I sub P as the polar moment of inertia. Remember that uh, the polar moment of inertia, which I said what could be J, for a circle, if we're looking at a circular cross section, that would be equal to uh, pi times r to the fourth divided by two, uh, which would also be equal to pi times the diameter to the fourth divided by uh, 32. Now, if you're looking for a, a hollow section, and we're going to see this very quickly, but with for a, a hollow section, the uh, polar moment of inertia, I, is going to be equal to I for the uh, outside minus I for the inside. Okay, so you take the polar moment of inertia of the larger outside and subtract the polar moment of inertia uh, for the, the smaller inside. And we'll, we'll see that. Then uh, we got into an uh, angle of twist where we said that the angle of twist of a, a shaft that was under torsional loading is equal to the torque times the length divided by the shear modulus of velocity g times again the polar moment of inertia. And remember that uh, g, and it'll be this section where we do the derivation of g, is equal to Young's modulus divided by 2 times the quantity 1 plus Poisson's ratio. Uh, in both of these equations right here, this equation here and this equation there, you have to be very careful of the units uh, because the torque has to be in maybe pound inches and the length in inches, which are, are maybe not as common as you would like. So be real careful with the units on those. Well, what I'd like to do is, is talk about uh, hollow shafts and some efficiencies that can be had there. And I'm going to look at three cases. I'm going to look at a, a case where we take a, a very large, and it should be circular shaft. All of our shafts, the, the analysis of this was a circular cross-section, which is probably most common. If you start looking at a uh, square cross-section, I think I sent this around the uh, class, it's, it's easy to see how that's twisted, but we really have, don't have the equations to deal with a, a torsion in a, a square cross-section. Well, let's uh, continue to look at those round cross-sections, and I'm going to say that this, it's not much of a circle, but uh, bear with me, We'll say this has an outside radius of 20 inches and an inside radius of 19 inches. So that's one case. The other case is we're going to look at a, a solid shaft that has a uh, radius of 10 inches. And finally, we're going to take that same solid shaft and hollow it out and look at something that has a um, outside radius of 10 inches and an inside radius of 9 inches. Okay, like that. Yes. Okay, so remember when we uh, we do this, we can say that the uh, polar moment of inertia is equal to uh, pi over 2, because everything's based on radius, pi over 2, times the uh, radius to the fourth, or for a, uh, that would be for a solid one. If I was looking for a, a hollow one, I would say the polar moment of inertia would be equal to, again, pi over 2. And then I'd look at my outside radius to the fourth minus the inside radius to the fourth. So those are the, uh, the two equations that I'm going to use going through this. And when I do that, I find out that the polar moment of inertia for this one is uh, 46,619 inches to the fourth. That the polar moment of inertia for this one is equal to 15,000 707 inches to the fourth. And interestingly enough, the polar moment of inertia for this one is 5,401 inches to the fourth. And you might say, well, yeah, you hollowed it out and it's able to hold less load. It has a smaller polar moment of inertia. And that's true. But I think if we look at the uh, 
another measure here. Let's assume that it's a foot long. Okay, which the uh, you know may not be a foot long, maybe ten feet long or something like that. You just multiply these values by ten. Uh, but if we assume that this is a, a a foot long, we can say then that the uh, volume here is um, fourteen seventy three or fourteen seventy cubic inches. That the uh, volume of this one is uh, thirty seven sixty nine cubic inches and that the uh, volume of this one is 716 cubic inches okay and the reason I talk about uh, volume is from uh, volume you can get what weight and to some extent cost okay so so if we look at these numbers, then uh, this case, the, uh, the hollow case, has about a third the polar moment of inertia, about a third the capacity. But what is its volume? It's about a fifth. It's, it's more than a fifth smaller, right? Yeah. So there's some efficiency th there. Look at this one. If you then compare these two, and granted, this one is larger. You may not have the physical space to put that in. But if you do have the space to put that in, this has what? Three times the polar moment of inertia of this one. And what's its volume? Half. Okay. So that wins on both scores. So coming up with a larger shaft that's hollow in cross-section uh, adds some real efficiencies. If you look at the rear drive shaft, it's pretty common in, in vehicles. Uh, they don't usually use a, a solid shaft. They'll use a, a very large, and it seems the trend is getting larger and larger. But they'll use a very large hollow shaft. Okay, some are up to about six inches in diameter now for the uh, the rear drive shafts on some vehicles. And that's partly because um, they're going with aluminum and and some uh, exotic fibers and things like that to help shock loading and vibration and things like that. Um, but much of that is based on on these calculations right here. So a lot of times people talk about some of the, some odd they have some odd things about well a hollow shaft is more efficient because it has two surfaces and whatnot. That's that's not true. A hollow shaft is more efficient because pound for pound it supports more. Uh, if you if you compare these two, you can see that you're putting your weight uh, where it makes more difference. And I think you've got some homework problems that, that talks about this too. Questions with that? Well, I'd like to then come back and uh, spend a little more time with that equation. That's, a, of course, analogous to um, our equation uh, for axial loads that delta was equal to PL over AE, right? And what we did with that, we're going to do with our equation for phi. So let's say that we have a, a situation where the uh, shafts are connected here. They have uh, different uh, cross-sectional properties and whatnot. We could talk about this as one, this is two, this is three, and maybe we could apply some torques here. There's torque one, and here is torque two, and maybe uh, here is torque three. We could talk about phi in this case being the sum from i equals one to n, n being three in this case, of t sub i times l sub i divided by g sub i times the polar moment of inertia for i. And like I was mentioning on drive shafts, if you change from an aluminum drive shaft to a steel drive shaft or from a steel drive shaft to a carbon fiber drive shaft, this uh, G is going to change uh, quite a bit. So it's a matter of just uh, going through uh, the accounting of that. And we're going to uh, tackle a problem in just a moment about that. Some other things that we might look at along these lines is let's say that we uh, the shaft is, is tapered like this, um, where the uh, polar moment of inertia is some function of x. We've got uh, x over here. Or maybe we have a... Uh, distributed torque. It's some sort of an auger and we have this uh, torque that's uh, distributed across there where T is some function 
of x. Well, what we can do with this is put this all together and say that phi is equal to the integral from 0 to L of the torque divided by g i sub p dx. And whatever is constant, you would just uh, pull out of that. They, they might none of them be constant. Questions with that then? Let's see if we can do an example with this one. So let's see how that plays out. So is it better when I have these drawn out already, or do you uh, like it that I slow down and draw these? Uh, slowing, down and drawing. slowing down and drawing? Okay. Okay, so this is what we've uh, got here. We've got a, a shaft that's built out of two sections, a six inch diameter uh, section that's five feet long and a four inch diameter section that's three feet long. And we've applied to this free end A, 30,000 uh, pound feet of uh, torque. And to this one, uh, 10,000 pound feet of torque at B. And we'd like to, one, figure out what the maximum shear stress is in those sections. I think we'll be kind of surprised uh, where it is. And then also the angle of twist out here at that uh, free end A. Questions with that? This is uh, 30 K feet, so 30,000 pound feet. The K is thousands of pounds. Likewise, the 10 K feet would be 10,000 pound feet. Okay. So after you do a tour like we saw on, on Friday, it's easy to uh, see some of these uh, large values, right? I mean, they had shafts that were a foot in diameter running around there, right? Yeah. So uh, on, on our tour group, the tour guide announced that we were going, that the main boiler or one of the boilers was running at 900 PSI superheated steam. Did the other tour group get that? So what if there's a pinhole in a pipe with 900 PSI steam? So it's literally like the cartoon. It cuts you in half. So the, uh, yeah, that's not too good. They, 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 you can actually play with it a little bit. If you take a rag or something on a stick, you can get the rag to catch on fire. And then uh, then you can just take the stick and cut it in half with the uh, steam, too. So that's always a joke when you're walking around because a lot of times you can't even hear the leak. But uh, hold a stick in front of you, and when the stick falls off, then you probably don't want to walk any further. But, uh, anyway, so, so back to uh, this problem here. Let's see if we can uh, calculate the uh, polar moment of inertia. So for uh, AB, I could talk about uh, AB here. I could talk about the polar moment of inertia. That's going to be, what was our polar moment of inertia? If we were given the uh, diameter, we know the uh, polar moment of inertia is pi times the diameter to the fourth divided by 32. Is that correct? So we started out with, I think so. So we've got then pi times the diameter here. That is uh, six inches. So that'll be six to the fourth divided by 32. 
which comes up as uh, 127.2 inches to the fourth. And likewise, if I were to do that for BC, I could talk about the polar moment of inertia as pi times the diameter, which would be a 4 to the fourth power divided by 32. And I get a much smaller 25.1 inches to the, the uh, fourth. So what I would do in one of these problems is is try and have a good accounting. Hopefully I don't have to keep recalculating these. I'm going to need it a couple times if I'm looking for both stress and uh, angle of twist. So I'm going to build myself a table and I'll talk about section. Whether that section is uh, AB or that section is BC. And then maybe I'll talk about the polar moment of inertia in inches to the fourth. And so for AB, we have 127.2. For BC, we have 25.1. Maybe we should talk about torque then. What's the uh, torque going to be in, uh, let's see, we could do this in K feet. So for the AB section, what's the internal torque in this section here? Should be 30, right? I mean, if you were to uh, take a, a section that looked like this, it wouldn't uh, take much to realize that if you have uh, 30 here, you have to have 30 there, right? So this is going to be uh, 30. What about the BC section? Well, if I take a, a section that looks like this, And I put those in there, and I have uh, 10 going this way, and I have uh, 30 going this way. What are we left with? 20, right? Okay, 20. So we've got those. That's good. Now we could talk about the, uh, the shear stress. Remember that the uh, shear stress tau is equal to the torque times R divided by the polar moment of inertia. So in the uh, first case, the, uh, the torque that I might have is, what, 30 k feet. And then the uh, radius, if I'm looking at the uh, AB section, that radius is going to be 3 inches. And I divide by the polar moment of inertia, 127.2. Now let's see, how are the units going to work on this? This is inches to the fourth. I'm going to have to multiply this by a thousand pounds in a uh, K, so I get to cancel that with that. And then I'm also going to have to multiply it by what? 12 inches in a foot. So now I have inches squared over inches to the fourth. So I'm left with something in inches squared in the numerator. No, not inches squared in the numerator. Inches squared in the denominator and pounds in the numerator, which is PSI. That's good. And when you run that number, you come up with 8,488. A little too many significant figures, but that's okay. Okay. Where did This came from the K. And the 12 is because I have the length in, or the, tor the, the torque in uh, pound feet rather than pound inches. Okay, so I could put the uh, stress here, tau in PSI and in the, so in the first section I end up with uh, 8488. Well time is money. Should I do the other section? It's got less torque in it. We probably, probably still want to go through that, don't we? Because while I use a much smaller number 20 
I'm going to be uh, using a smaller radius, aren't I? So the radius is going to be 2 inches. I still have this 1,000 that I have to multiply and this 12 that I have to multiply. Uh, but here's where the big difference is. I divide by what? Not 127, but 25.1. So when you run through the calculation here, you get 19,099 PSI. So I'm glad we did that. Okay, 19,000, 19,000. So definitely we get our largest stre stress in the BC section. Okay. So when I go to calculate the uh, angle of twist, I could look at the angle of twist for uh, a, B, what's that going to look like? Well, what's our equation for the angle of twist? The torque times the length divided by the shear modulus of elasticity divided by the polar moment of inertia, is that right? So for section A, B, I could say that I'm going to have the, uh, the torque is 30 times 10 to the 3. I'll take care of that 1,000 right away there. And then the uh, length is, what, 5 feet? And then I'm still going to have to multiply this by 12 squared because I have feet as in 5 feet here. And this is foot pounds. So I'll end up with a uh, 12 squared in the numerator. I'm going to be dividing by uh, 12 times 10 to the 6 PSI and the polar moment of inertia. Do we have the polar moment of inertia for AB? Yeah, we were smart enough to put this in our table up there, 127.2. So when you uh, run through that, that turns out to be equal to uh, 0 0.0141 radians. Okay. Okay, so you get that many radians. And if I, if it seemed a little careless with my units here, I can double check the units on this thing. What were the units on this? This would be uh, 30,000 because I put the 10 to the 3, so this is just plain old uh, pound feet of torque. The 5 is going to be uh, feet. So we have feet there, and then this the uh, 12 squared, that is inches squared over feet squared, right? And then the uh, 12 to the 6, that was pounds per inch squared, and the uh, I is going to be inches to the fourth. So I get to cancel this foot and that foot with that. I get to cancel that pound and that pound and this and that with that. So we have no units or radians on that thing. So the way that worked out. Well, if I finish up for the uh, BC section, yes? Why are we dividing by... I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Oh, uh-huh, uh -huh, because it's either uh, pi times the diameter of the fourth over 32, or the first one we saw was pi times the uh, radius to the fourth over 2. So if you divide the diameter by 2 to get the uh, radius, and then you have to multiply, uh, take that to the fourth power. Other questions? Uh, just the angle of twist. So let me talk about the uh, angle of twist uh, phi for the uh, BC section. We'd go through a very similar process. Again, torque times the length divided by G times the polar moment of inertia. 
And in this case, we'd only have 20 times 10 to the 3. And its length would only be 3 feet. We'd still have that uh, 12 squared for the units. Here to have the uh, 12 times 10 to the 6. Apparently, it's all the same material. But this has a much smaller polar moment of inertia, so I have 25.1. When you run the numbers on this one, you get uh, 0 0.0286. So we get quite a bit more twist, don't we? About twice as much because it has the much smaller polar moment of inertia. So if I wanted the angle of twist at A, Looking at A here, the angle of twist at A is going to be the angle of twist at B, which is the angle of twist for BC, plus, because they're going to be in the same direction, the angle of twist for AB. So I'm going to add those together and say that that is 0 0.0141 plus 0 0.0286 radians. which uh, turns out to be, you can add those together. I actually didn't add those together, but I converted. So then take that thing and multiply by 180 over pi, and you get a final answer of 0 0.811 degrees. Okay. No, I think I got you the wrong answer there. That's just that's just part of it. What should it be? Two point four five. Anyone else get two point four five? Good. So two point four five. Anyone else getting that? You go good. Okay. Well, what do you think about that answer? Is that reasonable? Remember that we said that the tangent of gamma was about equal to gamma, and that had, the requirement for that was that it was a small angle. Is 2.45 a small angle? Yeah. Anything less than about 5 degrees, maybe even 10 degrees, we're going to consider as a small angle. So I think we're okay with this. If there's some sort of a silly putty or flubber or something that we had uh, 300 uh, degrees of twist on, uh, all bets would be off because we could no longer trust this equation because our derivation here was not legit. So when we get together next time, we'll talk about how we can use these equations to help us with statically indeterminate problems, very much like we did in the axial case. Take care until then. Thank <laughs> you.